My name is Fibus de Coyanis. I'm a senior research fellow in data science in the International Center for Radio Astronomy Research. And I'm presenting the latest work on change detection on very high resolution aerial, remote, aerial images. <clears throat> so what is change detection? Uh, in terms of computer vision definitions, change detection is the process where we take two input images and produce a single semantic segmentation mask. Uh, this requires a necessary parenthesis from the issues for those who are not familiar for the semantic segmentation task. So this is where we take as input an image and assign a class label on each pixel of that image. So for example, here in the bottom left corner, we have a class labels bottle. We have labels cube and notice that individual an object of cubes that exist in the image are assigned the same label. That is, in semantic segmentation, we do not distinguish between individual objects. So, change detection. Some thoughts, some hypotheses we use in order to perform our modeling approach. So, we need to identify in the, in the, in this, in the remote sensing community, change detection means we need to identify change in objects of interest between two co-registered uh, images of the same area at different time. <laughs> Our hypothesis is the following. The first is that identifying change is a higher cognitive process. We know this because in psychology people have done experiments and when we try to identify change between images which are more complex, it usually takes more time in comparison with simpler objects. Uh, based on this uh, observation, we also understand that uh, Change uh, cannot be identified by a mere subtraction, which is a constant time operation. So we hypothesize that uh, this process of identifying change is something similar to human attention. You can see in these uh, images, like in the top row, the change in buildings class, where here we have no buildings, here are buildings being built. And notice that the second image, which has everywhere buildings scattered, much more difficult, much more time consuming to identify the change in these small buildings. Now, starting our test on attention, um, in, in very quickly, just to say for people who are not familiar, attention is the process where we consume an input, a set of features, and from that we produce a query and a set of keys and values. Usually in, in vision, this is you know, happening with convolution. And what we do is then we compare the query with the keys, we find which elements of the keys uh, actually correspond to the query, and then we use these elements to highlight the corresponding values that can be seen on the right in terms of equations. Now, some observations about the attention mechanism uh, that were created in neural machine translation. First is that uh, the dot product is not the best similarity operator because it's not bounded. And actually, this was a problem I was told in the Ivan Swami uh, by scaling this dot product. Um, the second is that the dot product is not a proper set similarity metric. There are other metrics here, like the dice. The third is that if we use this definition and uh, envision this becomes really memory prohibitive. And we have to say here that in the standard definition of uh, attention, that uh, when we go on to go from, uh, you know, from language A to language B, uh, what's happening is that the syntax of the changes changes, which means that we need to compare the relative position of the, the words in the first phrase with the relative position in the words in the second phrase. That is not necessarily the case with images, because images have channels like RGB, and these follow the same order, like they don't, don't change the order of channels. And the last uh, observation we need to make is like, how do we use attention with features? Um, here's an example of uh, why this is problematic when we use this definition, like uh, from, for example, from the self-attention gun paper on in images. Like when we increase the number of features, say it's 1024, the dot product between queries and keys produces a layer which is very large to be fit into the memory of the GPU. So this is one important problem to solve. Now, let's start thinking about, uh, actually we start thinking about replacing the dot with a set uh, similarity metric. And we thought of the dice because we've worked on the dice in the past and we've actually provided an improvement on that, the Tanimoto similarity with complement. And you can see the major difference with the three different functional forms of the dice here is how the gradients flow many point directly as Euclidean geodesics to the ground truth. Here the ground truth is one zero. 
This is for a toy example of two dimensional output X and Y. Now we did that and that improved, but it wasn't the best we can get. I mean, can we improve on that? Um, so you see here in the top row the, the standard tiny model and tiny model with complement, and here's the Laplacian uh, operator. You see that when we, the ground truth is somewhere between zero and one and not an integer zero on one, and the Laplacian is not spot on. Also, it's not very steep. So these are the things we're trying to improve. And it turns out that we could manage to improve on that. And the idea came by looking at the Tanimoto similarity or the dice, if you want, in this fractional form. One observation is that the product that is used in the self-attention is also a similarity operator. The question is, and what with the idea was, can we replace this product with another dice similarity and do an iterative process? The answer is yes, we could. And this is why it's being produced something like a fractal fractional form. It gets repeated as we increase the depth of the iteration. Uh, but luckily, with the Wolfram Mathematica, we managed to simplify this, uh, this very simple formula for any depth. So this is now computationally much easier to perform by the computer. And what this uh, fractal Tanimoto similarity does is that it makes the similarity steeper. You see here is for depth zero, the standard Tanimoto, for depth five, for depth 10, and this is an average for depth five, I think. And you see here the corresponding gradient flow. So this becomes steeper. And why is that important? It's important because it provides a finer layer similarity. Um, the first thing that uh, came out of this is a corollary, like we were aiming for this, which just happened. And that is like, we can use an evolving loss strategy uh, during training. So here in the, in the top left, you see the standard Tanimoto. Uh, we thought it's a Gaussian noise. And here you see a depth, uh, it's five here. And uh, what you observe is that as the model, as the training in the training converges, then we are heading to a plateau. And in this area here, the, uh, the average gradient is much less than the actual noise gradients. While in this case here, uh, what's happening is that even if you are in this area, which is close to optimality, even though you have steep uh, noise gradients, the average gradient is still deep enough. So what we do is that we start with the standard tiny model training, and when we reduce the learning rate, we switch to shift gears, and we increase the depth, and that increases the steepness of the loss function. And that we found improved performance. So you see here on the right, the improvement on the test accuracy is small, but if we look at the for CFR10, the multi-class Matthews correlation coefficient, or as Mixer provides the, the Pearson correlation coefficient, it's about 70% improvement. So that shows that we improve the quality of the result. So we introduced the fractal attention layer. It does both channel and spatial attention. Uh, one key distinguishing between the standard attention and this, among other things, is that we do not compare each uh, channel of the query with each channel of the keys. Instead, we compare them element-wise, like the, the corresponding positions of the channels in queries and keys are being uh, compared. Uh, we provide uh, uh, a spatial similarity and a channel similarity. And that depends, that depends on if we are comparing, if we're summing in the, in the, the fractal Tanimoto on the spatial axis or on the channel axis. The output of this uh, process is uh, um, something that is scaled in the value zero to one, something like a sigmoid. So it doesn't need scaling if uh, it is irrespective of the size of the features. That's very good. So we don't need to correct with the number of features as was done in the value. Uh, we do need to normalize in the end, though, just like we will do it after a sigmoid. Uh, the second question that, the final question we try to address is, how do you fuse the attention layer? Okay, now you created an attention that's working well. How do you actually fuse it? It's equally important how you define the attention. So we see here, uh, for example, a case because the query, the key, and the values, and that is mostly about the values the issue here, like it's a sigmoid activation. That means that this is where we want to emphasize are something like ones, and pieces where are not important, we don't want to emphasize are something like zero. Which means that if we multiply the attention layer element-wise with the input features layer, we can erase the information where we do not need to attend. But it might be the case that there is information there that is important that we need to use in subsequent levels of the network. So what we did is that we multiply element-wise with attention layer, then we add that to the original layer uh, with the scaling factor starting from zero. This is a trainable parameter. A similar fashion is done with Sagar. And we found that this works really well. 
Second question is, okay, now you have change detection. You're going to compare two different images. How do you use attention between two different images? And then we addressed the, we thought about the concept of relative attention. The idea here is that what is important on image one is the information that exists on image two. And we can do the symmetric operation if it is necessary, which is here the case. So we apply the attention layer by using SQ for, for the evaluation of query, first image, like the first layer, and for keys and values, the second layer. And we provide the, we find the attention of that, and then we add it on the input layer one. And we do the same for the second layer, and then we concoct the, the two layers. That worked very well in, in producing outputs that they need a relative comparison. So we're not telling the algorithm how to compare, we're telling that the information for the comparison exists in one to the other. So we defined based on these the things two feature extraction building blocks. The signal, which is the compress expand and express compress expand compress network. You see here that we take the initial features, we split them channels in two, we compress and expand in a something like a mini unit. And this is something like a mini cut net, the expand and compress, where we double the volume of the features and then reduce it. And by volume, we mean the product of number of channels and spatial dimension. And this is the, a lighter version of this, the fractal ResNet, where we basically have the standard residual building block. Then we also have the fractal attention on the input, and we fuse these two with this operation. We did an experiment on CIFAR 10, we showed that SIGNET is working really well and better than the standard ResNet, so this gave us courage to continue. Uh, then the question is, how do you actually uh, compare, or how do you consume two inputs uh, for that? We define the mantis macro topology, like the animal mantis in Australia. It's very nice, the mantis stream. And um, what's happening here is that we, this is something like a, a CMA's network. But the features produced from each input image are not being subtracted. Just fuse them together with relative attention. So we say to the network, look, the features here, what's important on these features is going to be regulated by what exists in, in the other features and so on. And then we take these features and we put them into the expansion layers, like it was one branch will be like a unit, but now we're using for, in terms of the encoder, we're using the fused features. And uh, we managed to achieve a state of the art performance on the Levere change detection data set. You can see here in the right images on the first column, bit one, the second column, bit two, on the third column, ground truth for three different scenarios, on the fourth column, predictions, and this is the confidence heat map. And observe that the algorithm is very confident about whether there is change. This is for the signal, uh, even though the two images can look very, very different. We also managed to achieve state-of-the-art performance on Wu. We have to note here that uh, the other people that have tried on this, they haven't performed the standard splitting, so the standard train test splitting does not exist here. But as we described in the paper, actually the splitting we did uh, removes the spatial uh, correlation the training and the testing areas are spatially separated and we should be doing actually worse in comparison with these split areas here. Again, here you can see uh, input date one, date two, ground truth, prediction and confidence heat map for the signal model. Uh, here you can see a comparison in the first row we have the, the uh, two images like date one, date two, ground truth. This is the confidence heat map from the signal model. This is from the fractal resonant model. You can see that in general signal performs a little bit better than the fractal. There's no difference in uh, 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 computing time and um, uh, memory load, so signal is a much heavier network. So it really depends on the use case and if somebody wants to use these resources, significant resources or not. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your time.